Hi everyone, I'm the Plant Propagator and welcome to my channel. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about the work that I do, please subscribe to my channel. Today, uh, we are in my old university laboratory and what I wanna share with you is something that may be a little difficult to share with you through a uh, video. Uh, but I want to talk with you about a little bit about media preparation and what I want to focus on really is media preparation for orchids um, and What I do in my laboratory is a little bit different from what most people are going to do in their their homes as a hobbyist uh, in, in doing orchid flasking and deflasking uh, and it's actually it might be a little bit different for what people do in industry, so the commercial orchid uh, producers. Uh, the University Laboratory, we, we do a lot of media manipulation. We vary the different media components, and my laboratory is set up uh, to do that. So I look a lot, all my media are custom made. There's all the different media components that, that I add, and because of that, I do things a little bit differently. But what I'm gonna try to do is show you what I do in my laboratory and try to explain a little bit how um, this relates to what you may be doing, uh, not in the commercial environment, but if you've got a, uh, if you're doing any, anything like this at home. So uh, first of all, uh, media preparation. Uh, most of the orchids grow on a, a defined uh, medium and the medium contains lots of minerals, uh, nutrients, uh, sugar, uh, sucrose is the main sugar that most people use. It can contain uh, activated charcoal um, and banana. I've seen a lot of other uh, really interesting media addenda that can be used. Um, and the, the thing is you can do, there's a lot of different types of media that can be made. There's uh, medium for uh, seed germination, there's medium for replating, there can be different stages, you can even break the, the, the seed development down into a few different steps and use a different medium uh, for each different step. But what I want to do is just go over in a general sense, uh, like I said, what I do in my laboratory and what you may be uh, doing in, in your own situation. So first of all, this is uh, what I do is I use uh, different stock solutions. And I should mention that um, I, I come from, um, I'm actually the grand student of one of the people that um, developed one of the media, one of the mediums that is used for a lot of plant tissue culture work. So I am a grand student of Toshio Murashigi who was a faculty member at the University of California at Riverside and developed a lot of the medium. And I use a lot of his um, methods just because of my academic background uh, that, again, many other laboratories may not still be using. But I do a lot of things old school. So I have different stock solutions that I mix together in order to make my medium. Um, and all my stock solutions are made up at uh, 100X. I have vitamins, I have iron, I have halides, I have um, just all of these different, different stocks. And what you do is I make them up at um, 100X, which means I add 10 milliliters of each of these stocks per liter. Some of the, uh, the stock bottles are wrapped in foil, and this is of vitamins, and vitamins tend to be uh, sensitive to light. So I, I store the vitamin stock solution uh, is, is in a dark bottle. Um, also, this is iron, and the, the iron here is also light sensitive. So, uh, and this is something that you need to be aware of with your medium as you prepare it, is some of the medium components are light sensitive. So I store my media, after I prepare it, I'll store it at least in the dark. Sometimes I'll store it in the dark in the refrigerator. So these bottles, uh, not all of them, this is clear, as you can see here. So these are the halide stocks, and the halide stocks, there, there's no light sensitivity here. All right, so what I do is I mix everything uh, up from the different stocks. I have um, media formulation sheets that I can show you. And so in my notebook shown right here, this is a medium formulation sheet. And I check, I also have individual, um, in my notebook, I write 
the, the media uh, right here that I'm making and I check as I add the individual components. And this is my official uh, laboratory uh, notebook that I use. Um, you probably won't be doing this in most environments. You'll be ordering either a, a pre-made um, salt stock of everything. And the, the company that I recommend that you buy that from is called Phytotech Labs. Uh, they're in Kansas. They're very Kansas in the USA. They're very um, reliable. So you can uh, purchase from them the orchid seed germination medium. Uh, that's for seed germination, as you might imagine. You can purchase from them the replate medium. So after the seedlings get to be, um, you know, a quarter of an inch tall, then you can transfer those individual seedlings to the replate medium in larger containers and flasks in order to get some additional growth. So um, you can, you when you buy those from Phytotech Labs, you just add the salts that are in a container to water make it up to a certain volume, and you're good to go. Um, you don't need to adjust the pH. You don't really need to do much of anything. Uh, those can be uh, put in a pressure cooker or autoclaved uh, in order to make the contents sterile. Um, in my laboratory, I have to add each of the medium components. One of the things that I, that I like to add for the replate medium is the beech nut um, banana baby food. And what, what's, what happens when you add the beech nut baby food and, and a lot of the medium components is it tends to, it tends to vary the pH. It tends to drop the pH. So I have to pH all of my medium using a pH meter that's outside the field of view here. But my pH meter is right here. I should also say that everything in my lab is aligned. I have my balances right here and all of my chemicals are on the shelves in front of me so I can uh, add these chemicals uh, using the balances, analytical balance and top loading balance to my media. I make my media on top of, you can't see it, stir plates right here. So I'll have a container with a stir bar in it that'll be stirring as I'll add my medium components. Uh, I add my media with uh, pipettes and um, pipetting tools. So I add all these medium components together while they're stirring. After I add everything, I adjust the pH to 5.7 in a pre-prepared medium that won't be necessary. Um, so I add the pH, I adjust the pH, and then I add my solidifying agent, uh, which is agar. In, in my case, I use um, a different solidifying agent called Gelrite, which is a little bit more difficult to use. Uh, it solidifies clear and you get a little bit of better root growth, but it solidifies at higher temperature, which means you've got to be a little bit more careful. So I do a lot of things that are a little different um, from, what, from what many labs do. The use of agar in, in place of Gelrite is fine. Uh, sugar, let me show you one thing. So, so sugar, I use um, good quality um, sugar, but I also have evaluated this sugar, store-bought sugar. And from the evaluations that I've done, in most cases, it doesn't make difference. This is fine. It doesn't make a difference. This is fine. Uh, it's a lot cheaper than the laboratory grade uh, sucrose. So use, use of that sugar is, is, is fine. Um, the one thing is that there's, you know, depending on what medium formulation, what orchids you're using, a number of different things, uh, you may or may not add activated charcoal, and you can buy the medium prepared plus or minus activated charcoal. Uh, and what the charcoal does in certain orchids, it's beneficial for growth. It's be beneficial for germination. It's better for growth. Um, you may ask, okay, how do I know I have this orchid? How do I know what medium is going to be best for it, for seed germination, for replate, for subsequent seedling development? How do you know it's going to work best? And, and unfortunately, it's trial and error. You just have to, you just have to evaluate the, these. For most of what I've done, I don't think it hurts to have activated charcoal in the seed germination medium. It's beneficial for most of what I've been evaluating, uh, mostly the Cattleya and Dendrobium groups. Doesn't hurt to have activated charcoal in the, the replate, the second, second step of the medium. 
but this is there there's a lot going on here it can e even from one cattleya to the other you can get differences it depends on the plant depends on the type of um, growth the stage of phase of growth it depends on a number of different things but um, there are certain recommendations that you can take and again the media from phytotech labs are probably going to work pretty good for you those are a good consensus medium that works best my medium that I've developed here is actually a variation from that. Even the basic salt formulations is a little bit of a difference, a different from, uh, from what they use. And it's a medium that I developed myself. I haven't published on it yet, so that information hasn't been made public. It's not much different. It won't work very. It won't work that differently. But in, in my hands, certainly for the replay for the second for the seedling development. Uh, in my hands, it works better for most of the orchids uh, that I work on. So um, that's kind of gives you an overview of uh, media prep and what's involved and what are the essential medium components. Um, th there's, there's a couple other things. When you prepare the medium, I prepare my medium in large glass jars. I autoclave it and then I pour it in the hood. Um, many laboratories, they actually melt they make up the medium, they melt the agar into the medium, and then they pour it into the glass jars and then put that in a pressure cooker or autoclave and do it that way. So there's all different ways to, uh, to do these things. In my hands, uh, I do a lot of um, work with Petri dishes. These are not, these are plastic Petri dishes. These are not autoclavable, but they come sterile. So I make my media in the big bottles and then I pour it into these sterile uh, Petri dishes and use it, use it like that. Uh, when I'm done with these, I toss them. I don't wash them and reuse them. Uh, with the, some of the, the, with the, the flasks, I do wash those and reuse those. So um, again, there's all different types of approaches that can be used. Um, what I wanna do next is take you around the lab and show you just a little bit more of some of the things in the laboratory and try to relate that to what you may be using in if you're working in a home laboratory type environment. So let's take a look around the lab. Okay, now we are looking at the water purification system in my laboratory. This is actually a four cartridge purification system. Um, the cartridges contain various things that are deionizers, there's charcoal, and then at the end there is a, a filter uh, that's, that comes out. This, the water out of here, then goes into this, which is a glass still. It's not running right now. So the still part is over on the uh, right here. That's a heating coil. Uh, the coils for distilling the water are right up there. This then flows down into this tank. So this is glass, this is really high quality water. Do you need glass, this is, this is uh, deionized glass distilled water. Do you need this for most of your work? And the answer is probably not. Again, in a university laboratory, uh, we have to have things just right. So we use this. Uh, reverse osmosis water, if you have that is fine. If you want to buy distilled water, that's essentially what this is. Uh, the, in one of the labs that I work in, we just use tap water. It's a very good quality tap water uh, that doesn't have very many salts in it. We use that. So um, you can use a variety of different things. What we do a lot of is just kind of try it and see how it goes. If, if you can get um, distilled water easily, I would just go ahead and use that for media prep. Um, if you can't just use tap water, in some cases, it's going to work fine. Okay, moving around to the lab, I want to show you my autoclaves right here. So these are a couple of uh, sterilmatic autoclaves. And so these are essentially what, this is what you use to uh, autoclave the medium. And uh, the one on the left is open, the one on the right is closed. Uh, these are essentially big pressure cookers, but you can put a lot in there. Um, these, these, uh, have, these are workhorses. These have been working for me for years and years 
in years. Uh, but this, these are essentially a large pressure cooker. If you want to use a pressure cooker, uh, it's fine. I really like using uh, these, these autoclaves. One of the things, uh, you look to the right of the autoclave, there's an oven that I don't use, but then there is a, a water bath right here. And the water bath lets you take your media out of the autoclave and put it in there and it keeps it the right temperature so that the medium remains liquid and then and it cools down so then you can take it out and pour it as needed. When it comes out of the autoclaves it's real it's boiling hot. It is just it cooks. And so this is this water bath adjusts the temperature and you can essentially take a tub or a sous vide or something like this and make a make your own water bath to uh, to to place your medium in if you need to have it uh, at a lower temperature before you pour it. If you autoclaving it in the uh, vessels that you're going to end up using in the flasks that you're going to end up using, certainly you don't need to do that. You can just take it take it out and let the flasks the medium in the flasks solidify. Okay, so that's it for some of these components. We'll take a look at some of the other um, some of the other equipment in the lab. And we are back. I hope you can hear me. Uh, we got a lot of fans running in the laboratory here, and I wanted to show you this view of my uh, culture shelves just to show you the setup in here. So this is a laboratory design and a culture shelf design that was handed down to me through my academic advisor, and this is the, uh, the design that she used in, in her laboratory. But essentially, these are standard, these are fluorescent lights. Um, you can't tell, but this is a wide spectrum and this is a grow lux. So this is a little bit more red and this has a lot of purple in it. Um, I used, I built this laboratory, designed the laboratory many years ago. And I, this is before the days of LEDs. And so this worked well for me for most of my career. Um, if I had to do it over again, I would certainly use the, uh, the, the red, purple LED grow lights that are now available. What I had to do in this laboratory is the ballast for these lights that generate some heat, those are mounted remotely. So those are actually at the top of these shelves. Uh, LEDs don't generate the light. You actually bypass the ballast for use of LEDs, so it's a much better technology for using using in a growth room like this. But the lights are placed um, one foot apart, and then the lights are hanging about uh, about well, the shelves are about a foot apart too. So if you take a light meter and go across here, it's very uniform illumination, which has been very useful for me uh, to use. Uh, the shelves also. I should say these are this is um, white material. You don't with the fans that you can hear in the background. There's really good air circulation in here. Uh, the humidity doesn't matter because these plates are wrapped and your flasks are wrapped. So you, it doesn't matter what the uh, what the outside humidity is in this room. It's really dry in here because it's the winter time. Uh, it is. Uh, it's uh, November 30th right now, uh, today. Um, but the flat, everything is, everything's wrapped, so it, it's really dry where I am right now, but it doesn't matter. The, the, I should say the shelf material, it's white, and it's also, um, it's also trans, it's, um, the, the air passes through here. Let me show you. Um, so the, uh, the light, the, the shelving material is actually grading material for uh, fluorescent lights. And what you may not be able to see, but these are, there's holes in, in the shelves. And this allows the air to circulate. And so what happens is you don't get heat build up underneath the shelves from the lights, which means the bottom of the containers don't heat up, which means you don't have condensation issues. So all of these plates, are, there's no condensation, which can be a problem in, in laboratories. If you get condensation, the condensation drops on the medium, and then things float away. If there's contamination, it, uh, the contamination spreads. And these plates do not, I do not have issues with condensation of any of, uh, any of the plates because of the way the laboratory was designed. So it's, uh, again, having these um, lights that don't generate heat, having white shelves and having them open using this, it's, it's light grating 
that goes underneath fluorescent lights when you mount them and it just lets it lets light through but more importantly for me it lets it lets the air come through so you can use I've seen stainless steel um, shelves and those will be fine uh, this is this is white it's also reflective like the stainless steel is and you don't get any kind of heat uh, buildup from the lights uh, and from the heat generated from the lights so I think that's all I have for today I just wanted to kind of give you an overview of media preparation and how my lab how my culture room is set up for growing these um, these orchid seedlings um, in in, in the laboratory. So that's all I have for today. I hope you enjoy the video today and happy propagating.